What's going on, motorized bike enthusiasts? We got some updates for you guys today. First, the Phantom 85 was power looped last week unintentionally, and I skinned up my knees pretty good, tweaked my right wrist, but we're okay, healing up. Um, I haven't been doing any riding since then just to make sure I don't mess anything up worse than it already is, but we should be back up running in a week or two. And I'm really excited because we got the Swin Taff up and running with the Zeta Triple 40 at the moment as we're still waiting on the Wildcat from California Motorbikes. Uh, tracking number says it should be here tomorrow. However, their WC80 pipe showed up. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Unfortunately, in that crash, we got some road rash on the daily driver, so it needs to be repaired, and we're going to be working on that once this video is uploaded. And we smashed one of the lenses on our 360 camera. Unfortunately, by design, 360 cameras have exposed lenses. I didn't use any lens guards with this because they affect the stitch line which just, I'm a stickler about video quality. However, I think what I'll do in the future is I'll use lens protectors when I'm riding the bikes and I'll take them off when I'm trying to get really nice footage and I know I'm not gonna crash. Anyways, moving on. The WC85 pipe, I think they do some kind of drop shipping with it because it showed up in a couple of days after I ordered it. From the pictures, it looks identical to the Bikeberry's Deluxe expansion chamber and in the pictures, both of them just show to have absolute terrible welding. And, well, mine's no better. The welding on this thing looks like garbage, but there's no pinholes. I did a pressure test, it holds pressure, so we have a sealed pipe. It might not look pretty, but I do think it's going to give us better performance than the MZ65 clone pipes. The reason for this is it has a much wider header tube and a smoother transition into the diffuser, whereas the MZ65 has a thinner header that just goes straight to the expansion chamber with no real diffuser. So, that's interesting, but we won't know for sure until we start doing some side-by-side -side comparisons, which I have fully planned in the future. We're going to get into an overview of the Swin Taff and some test rides here in a moment, but here's what we got going on. It's got the Zeta Triple Forty bottom end with a brand new G4 cylinder, a piston, piston ring, so we have to treat it like it's being broken in, because essentially it is. However, we did some port work to the cylinder, just the exhaust for now. I plan on going much further with this, because that's what this build is intended for, it's for port experimenting. For now we have 160 duration on the exhaust which has been widened to a hunt, uh, sorry, it's been widened to 32 millimeters. Um, the head has been slightly decked to improve our squish and we're running a squish of 0.7 millimeters right now and uh, that's what we got going on so we'll do more port work to it in the future to see what it likes. Alright so let's get straight into the test ride. <laughs> Oh, appreciate it, sir. No problem. You too. Man.
So it's been a messy past week, but that is one thing I love about this hobby, is digging deep into it does not require a shop. Maybe a dedicated room if you really enjoy the hobby, but anyone can do this. Completing this build and writing it for the first time was such a relief. The Swin Taff is a build I wanted to work so bad, but I assumed it was too good to be true. As I bolted on each individual part and saw just how tight everything was going to fit, I always had in the back of my mind the thought that the next part was going to be a showstopper or require some massive modification. That just wasn't the case. I got lucky as it's almost like this bike was designed for these parts with no modifications to the frame except for one tiny little thing that I could have overcome if I really wanted to and we'll show you that in a moment. Anyways I'm really excited about this and I can't wait to take it out to the trails when the weather starts to cool off and I'm healed up. This is essentially my dream bike. Low budget, decent quality, fits a motor. I mean, I can't ask for much more. I was even able to get the chain on without a tensioner and the proper chain tension. Be it a little tight, but it's a new chain so it'll stretch. I cannot believe how well this thing came together. If it holds up, which I suspect it will, this is gonna be my new favorite bike for damn near everything, but trails especially. So this bike needs a name. Leave your suggestions in the comments. The build went together pretty smooth. It is a super tight fit, but only one tiny modification to the frame, which you could probably do without. And all I had to do was just shave down one of these little uh, bottle, water bottle mounts underneath the motor mount here. I just took a cutoff wheel and I just shaved it down. Um, you could probably get away without doing that. But uh, I did it so that the motor mount would sit a little more flush. Now, we still got some work to do to this bike to really kind of clean it up. But this might be a really good option for a lot of you guys. Starting up front here, aluminum throttle. It's nothing fancy. They're still cheap. I just went with the aluminum one because they're a little more secure, less prone to breaking. We kept our shifters. Now, at the moment, I need to adjust the derailleur. It's not shifting right, but that's uh, normal. We have separate levers for our front and rear brake, but I'm going to make this a dual lever setup on the throttle side for the brakes. Too many times I find myself trying to figure out which one of these <laughs> is the clutch. And in an emergency situation, if you squeeze the front brake thinking it's the clutch, you're probably gonna have a really bad day, especially me, because my wrist is a little tweaked from the last interaction we had with a powerful motor. The kill switch is mislabeled, so I'm gonna fix that, but it does work. By removing this brake lever here and going with the dual brake lever, I'll be able to bring it a little closer to the grip, make it easier to manipulate. The WC80 pipe, the Wildcat 80, it's fine. I don't see any issues with it. The welds are ugly, but there's no pinholes. Some viewers had mentioned not to get it because they couldn't make it fit. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, they must really not have tried. The only issues I ran into were these holes were just a little too, they weren't quite narrow enough. I just took a, a sanding wheel and removed a little bit of material so it would mount. The other one was right here. I've never gotten a single one of these expansion chambers where this support tab actually lines up with the motor. I have no idea why but every single one of them is always too far forward or too far back. It might have something to do with an aftermarket head. Maybe they're not designed for the G4, but I don't know. You think they would just make a thicker tab with multiple mounting points, but we made it work. Uh, you can get away with just some big washers and whatever. I had to offset the hole and clamp it to the case. This right here is just an extra one of these from the Path Dragon's original forks when they went out. 
I just put it on there because I thought it looked interesting and made uh, kind of drew your attention away from the fact that I had to offset that mount. We hacked off a pipe, slid it in, clamped it with some rubber hose and some hose clamps. Uh, eventually, when I'm out on a trail, I'll take it off and really listen to the motor purr. I'm just running stock exhaust exit. I'll uh, play around with drilling a couple holes in here, see what she does after breaking, see if they help or hurt it. And holes I can always replug with a bolt and washer, so no big deal. I have to run a silencer. That's just how it is. I won't run one of these pipes and piss off everyone in the neighborhood. You know, if that's your thing, whatever. It's not my thing. With this particular frame, I knew anything I used was going to be tight. Even the stock exhaust system wouldn't clear the frame. So all around, we're decent. Up here, which I'm probably not going to be able to show you in the camera, but the mounting plate for the gas tank pushes up against the pipe which prevents it from contacting the tank. And this exact spot on the frame, I mean, to the centimeter, is literally the only place I can put the tank to clear the pipe. <laughs> it's almost like this bike was designed for it accidentally. And the motor, as mentioned, you're limited on your options because the spark plug has to come out the front. So single jugs, um, like the YD100 or the uh, Phantom 85 won't work unless you plan on removing the plug, filling in that hole and drilling and tapping your own into what uh, uh, would be an interesting concept. Never tried that, might work. Mounting, it's not pretty. The rear, I got to touch up this paint, which I plan on doing because I want this build to stay pretty. I have to replace some of this old hardware with some fresh stuff that's not rusted up, but I had to slightly widen this mount because this is a 33 millimeter seat tube. So the down tube or the seat tube is thicker and wouldn't quite wrap around the cradle. So we just took a sanding wheel and removed a little bit of material on that mount until she fit. No big deal. At the front, it's not, I'm not proud of it. It's just how it's gotta be. Universal adapter with a little bit of rubber right there under the mount to prevent it from eating into the frame. Uh, the U-bolt is not great either because this is uh, its not a square tube, it's not a round tube, it's like, uh, it comes up at an angle and then squares off, but it's a little round on top, it's weird. It looks great, it's just weird for motors. Really wide for the U-bolt, could barely get it in there. Don't really like it. I'm gonna come up with something cleaner, less stress on the frame, but for now this will work. There's not really a lot of down forces on the frame so this little contact point's fine. Really most of the force that the frame's going to experience is here at the U-bolt as the motor pulls back as it pulls on the chain. This is the more important mounting point, in my opinion, for motor stability and chain alignment. But that still has to be secure because you only have two points of contact. Our intake, this is the CNC BBR tuning from Bikeberry. I really, really like this intake. It is beautifully made. Uh, it's designed for a 40 millimeter cylinder, so it's not one of those 38 and 40s, which means your intake can't be matched to the cylinder. If you have a 40 millimeter intake, you want to get the 40 millimeter mounts, not the universal intakes, because you can you have a better flow and you can match it to the port because you have more material to work with. So I really like that one. It even, even comes with an O-ring on it. I don't know how effective that is because. Uh, well, we don't, it doesn't matter in our case anyways, because we're using rubber hose. So here we just got heater hose, hose clamps, and right there is an old offset intake for, oh, it's just one of those crappy ones you can get on Amazon or eBay to clear the frame. They're junk, but I chopped it and used it as a mount for the carburetor. This is the third style of pull start I've found so far. In my opinion, it's the best design. This one says BT on it. I assume it's for the BT-80s, BT-100s. It's not perfect. The one tooth, uh, designed to grab onto the pulley is made of plastic and you only get one of them but everything else in there looks really well made so hopefully it'll last everyone's always screaming at me to use a real carburetor most of you are never going to outrun an NT carburetor from personal experience I know these are good for 45 miles an hour on a YD100 I know they keep up with the Phantom 85 and that thing is a monster and uh, on the discord server Sean has personally ported his own cylinder up to 11,000 RPM with a stock NT carburetor 
and his bike seems to be pulling pretty damn good. This is a 415 chain. Probably gonna replace it with an H if it'll fit. 56 tooth sprocket. And the braking system is all stock for the bike. So this is the Swins Half's stock brake setup. The only thing I had to do is loosen these screws, pull the caliper out, take off the disc and add three millimeters of spacing to clear the sprocket so that the caliper doesn't rub on the sprocket. So I'll give you guys some up closes of that. We have the clamp on adapter. I believe these are one and a half inch hubs. For me, it didn't matter. That clamp was too small. I had to machine it out. Took a long time with the Dremel. Not fun. Don't want to do that again. It's clamped onto the hub with rubber heater hose in between it. Really clamped down hard. I mean, really hard. I'm pretty sure that in clamping it down hard to prevent it from slipping, I have actually eaten into the hub. And when I look closely in the light, I can see some small dents where the clamp is squeezing the hub. This means it probably won't slip, but it's crushing the hub, which is why I really hate these things for so many reasons. Anyways, it doesn't appear to be slipping so far. We won't really know until we're out on the trail. And I've been using the pull start to start it to avoid any forward slipping. And for this 56 tooth sprocket, if you've been following the channel, the only modification to it we had to make was opening up the mouth. And my friend did that on his lathe. If you have some hole saws, you might be able to do it yourself with hand tools, but that's hardened steel and it took a long time. This is an aftermarket seat from Amazon. It had good reviews, it feels pretty comfy. It's got a built-in light, which is garbage. And that's not why I got it, but it is there. I got it because the reviews were good and it looks pretty decent. So this is what we got so far on the 2021 Swin Taff. I think this is going to be an amazing motorized bike for the price 